uh, record. Excellent. So we are now being recorded um, and we have our subtitles on. I think we are ready to go. So welcome everyone. My name is Lara Villamont, she and hers. I am Head of Outreach and Community Experience at the Framingham Public Library. And we are so thrilled to offer you tonight's program TBR, which stands for To Be Read, where we interview some of our favorite authors and find out what they are reading and recommend to us. Tonight, we are so thrilled to be here with Lynn Demianos. Let me also mention, unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight, but this program is in partnership with the Ashland Public Library. So thank you to them and thank you to the patrons from both Ashland and Framingham for joining us this evening. And thank you especially to Lynn for being here tonight. Uh, Lynn, before we got started, we were just chatting a little bit. Lynn wears a number of different hats. She is a photographer of environmental, you said, um, photography? All things for business. So basically people in buildings, yeah. Great people in buildings. Um, and then she is also a publisher and an author. So um, we are so thrilled to have you join us tonight. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much, Laura. And thank you, Mina um, from Ashland Public Library as well. All right, so let's dive into the big question. What is currently on your TBR pile? <laughs> well, it's actually so big that the pile of books next to my bed on my bedside table the stack was starting to lean over, so I had to divide it into two piles. <laughs> but right now I'm currently reading The Code Breaker about CRISPR therapeutics. And I'm also looking forward to reading a kind of a scary book called Madhouse at the End of the Earth about a boat that gets stuck in the ice in Antarctica based on a true story. Uh, really quick before you go on, Lynn, I just want to mention, because I know all of the folks here tonight are going to want to read at least some of these books, we will be sending out a follow-up email with all of the books that Lynn mentions here tonight, so you don't have to have your pen and paper frantically making notes. We're happy to send out those notes for you, and you can just enjoy hearing Lynn talk about her favorite books. Okay, I have two more also. Um, this particular book I purchased um, at the Ashton Public Library's uh, corner um, outdoor corners event that they had outside a couple of years ago. And uh, this also, this book called Following the Threads about the Hopedale Sewing Circle. So whenever I go to these author events, I buy books and then the pile keeps getting bigger. And But I usually try to read two or three at the same time that are different enough from each other that I can keep track. <laughs> I was going to ask, because I have never been able to read two books at the same time. How do you keep them all straight in your head? I make sure they're different enough that, you know, there's not an overlap in the, in the type of book that they are. So it's a lot easier. And I may be listening to one in my car and then reading one at home, that type of thing. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to mention folks, if you have any questions for Lynn, please feel free to use our question and answer section. Um, you can just click it on, on the bottom and enter your questions and we'll be happy to take them at the end. And if you would like to comment or chat amongst yourselves, please use the chat function. Um, please keep your questions for the Q&A and the chat for the chat if you would. And that makes it easier to make sure that we get to everybody's questions. Um, Lynn, which one are, what have you been looking forward to reading? Maybe it's not on your TBR pile just yet, but it's on your mind. Oh my gosh. Well, there's just so many. Um, I have a new author friend whose book is just about to hit the, the bookshelves. Um, it's called Out on the Rim of the Now. It's a book of poetry by Bart Malio, and I'm really looking forward to reading that. What have you read recently that you've loved? There's been quite a few. Um, Braiding Sweet Grass was something I read um, fairly recently that I enjoyed a lot and Where the Crawdads Sing. And I just saw the movie for Where the Crawdads Sing and I thought it was very loyal to the book. Um, I thought that was great and I would highly recommend it. And another book that I recently read that I love is called The Vanishing Half. Um, and that was based on a true story. I like historical fiction and um, some of these are more um, historical and nonfiction, but that's kind of my genre. I was going to ask that actually. So, um, you know, I know a lot of the, the works that you've published have mostly been along the lines of nonfiction. Um, mm -hmm. Is that your preferred genre to read? I think historical fiction, um, I, I mean, nonfiction can be fine, um, but historical nonfiction, I think is kind of interesting because obviously, for example, when I read Alaska, you know, no one really knows what the Mastodon thought, but 
you know, that's part of the book. So it, it kind of adds some interest and some details that, you know, wouldn't necessarily be there because no one really knows. So I do like reading a lot of biographies and autobiographies, especially about entrepreneurs. Um, but I would say historical nonfiction is my favorite genre. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a particular book or author that inspired you to become a writer? I would have to say no, but what really inspired me was telling a story that hadn't been yet told, um, which was about the historic Bancroft building. Um, you know, there really was not a succinct um, book about that. And um, the, the three books that I've actually published on my own were all kind of in the same vein about stories that had not yet been told as a, as a group. Is there a particular author that you look at as inspiring you now that you've published a few books and you're potentially thinking about some more? Well, this particular author has inspired me. I, I don't think that I would write a book like this book, but um, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox and the Horse by Charlie uh, Mackesy is to me very inspirational because there are beautiful pen and ink drawings and beautiful words that encourage people to be kind and um, do the right thing. And so in this day and age, to me, it's inspirational because it's not only beautiful and illustrated by the author himself, but also just inspires me to lead a, a good life. And um, even though it's not the kind of book that I would necessarily put together, it just makes me think about how much a book can influence me and it helps me realize you know how much I could influence other people whether I write a book about photography or a historical building or something so well as a multimedia multimedia creator do you find yourself drawn to multimedia books so books with illustrations or photographs or that sort of thing I think it's helpful because I think some people like myself are more visual and it's nice to have not only words where you can put your own imagination to um, what kind of images they help you conjure, but also to see some illustrations or photographs or paintings um, that might go with the words. I think it can be, um, you know, a more robust um, experience. So I, I do like the combination. I don't think it's a requirement, but I think it's it's nice. I know you said historical nonfiction is kind of your go-to genre. Is there a particular fiction genre that's sort of your go-to if you had to pick? <laughs> that is a tough one. Um, I really like children's uh, illustrated books that tell a, a fun story. Um, so I would say that I'm, I sort of gravitate toward those. Um, I know that one of our participants is a children's poetry author and I really enjoy fun things that might rhyme that tell a story and, and I might teach a lesson as well what's the best book that you've read that made you cry well <laughs> Jonathan Livingston Seagull made me cry but I think my favorite book and it kind of does a few things um, for me one is that it's one of the first books I remember reading as a young person, but it also made me cry <clears throat> and also made me happy because the, the ending was quite nice, which is Little Blue and Little Yellow. And this book was written the year I was born and it covers a lot of territory because it's about identity, it's about friends, it's about family, it's about um, not being heard and then being found. And so there's this kind of loss, there's love, there's friendship and reconnecting. And so it covers a lot. And it's really um, a children's book that has some very big themes to it. Um, and it's, it made a huge impression on me. And so I would recommend that book to anyone. When I was in library school, they always said, I took a children's literature class and they always said, children's literature seems like the easiest thing to do. And it's actually one of the hardest genres because you have to teach a lesson in an understandable, accessible and visually engaging kind of way. Right, right. And typically less than 32 pages. <laughs> <laughs> How about the best book that made you laugh? Um, definitely that was, I feel bad about my, my neck by Nora Ephron. 
that's an older book, but boy, was it funny, you know, about aging and what does your neck look like and this and that. So I found it hilarious. And what I, I found was that the older you are, if you read this book, the funnier it is, because I talked to, you know, my mother about it and, you know, older people and then younger people and the older you are, I guess the funnier it is. So <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Is there a particular book that surprised you? Oh boy. Um, and the turns or how good it was, whatever your interpretation of surprising is. Well, I would say some of the entre- entrepreneurial books that I read um, surprised me to learn about people's life stories um, as far as, you know, some of the things that they admit to, um, you know, former presidents or, you know, well-known entrepreneurs, you know, Steve Jobs, et cetera, that, you know, talk about a lot of very personal things in their books that, um, you know, I don't know that they would have wanted people to know about before they you know, became well-known. Um, so not anyone specific, but I would say a lot of um, biographies. I know this is another tricky one. Um, so we talked about children's literature and historical nonfiction. What's the best book that you read that is not in your genre? I'd have to go back to The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. Um, it, I, it's just such a beautifully written book. And um, you know, I don't know if I would consider it a children's book or just a book for all ages, but it's it's just beautiful. And it's the type of thing that I'd want to keep out on my coffee table um, all of the time and look at that. So uh, what book is a comfort read for you or an author? You know, it's a rainy day. You don't want to dive into a new book, but you've got a fresh cup of tea and you want to just reach for a goodie. Oh, boy. I'd say one of my many books of poetry, um, there's an author from Natick who wrote a book about heart heads and they're aliens that come down from outer space and teach humans how to be better people and to show love. And I think that's right now is my current comfy book. Now I have, um, in talking about other poets and other authors and that sort of thing, the eternal question is always when it comes to poetry, do you read it out loud or do you read it in your head? In my head. In your head. <laughs> I suppose I could read it out loud, I guess. No, but I just read it in my head. I do too. But many of the poets we talk to, they say you have to read it out loud. That is the way to read poetry. So I'm always curious for poetry lovers. Hmm. And I wow. confess I'm not much of a poetry person myself. So I like to hear from people who really do like the genre, what their preference is. Well, I think because I'm not a poet, I don't feel that I'm a poet and I'm reading it. I, um, I never really considered that, but I will try that and I'll get back to you. (laughs) Please do. Um, what is the first book that you remember reading on your own? I don't really remember, but I would, I, I do remember Pat the Bunny a lot and the, you know, Sea Spot Run and Dick and Jane and all of that. But the Pat the Bunny was around for a long, long time. And I remember it as a, you know, a young child and then reading it um, myself and then sharing it with my younger siblings. So I'd probably choose that. I also like a lot of the Eric Carle books, um, but I can't remember the specific one. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, and I have this next question here, but I wanted to ask uh, before we get to it, was there a particular moment when you were thinking about the Bancroft building that a book especially, but um, you thought, but I could actually write a book. I've never done it before, but I could do it this time. You know what I mean? Was there something that made you think that you could do it? Yes, something very specific, which was um, I was at a uh, group meeting with a bunch of professional photographers and we are all supposed to identify a personal project that we wanted to do. And we had to stand up and say what we would do and that we had to do it within the next year, sort of like a pact that we made. So I said that I wanted to put a book together about the Bancroft building and I actually have have it right here. This was the the first one. And um, then, and one of the reasons was was because the building was approximately a hundred years old. And so I thought it would be a nice time to put together a book like that. And, then when I started talking about it to other people in the Framingham area, um, Annie Murphy, the executive director of the History Center at that time said to me, well, you know, if you can put that together in four months, 
um, we can put the Bancroft Building on the history tour for the, 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 the house tour for the history center. And I said, four months, I've never done a book. I don't know what, you know, this is crazy. She said, oh, you can figure it out. So, you know, when you have a deadline, it's a lot easier to get things done. You know, the longer you have, the longer it takes. So that's what I did. And it was crazy. And I had help from a lot of people. And, and one of the side effects for putting that book together is it brought a lot of community together, like people in the building that didn't know each other that worked there you know, people from different organizations, History Center, et cetera. So um, it was really an interesting thing. But I think because I had made this promise, I threw out this ideal that I had about a book and it was a hundred years old, you know, the building and, you know, all these other things, it just really came together. And it was um, a wonderful, challenging, but wonderful experience. Well, wow. I can't imagine putting together a book in four months, much less kind of, you know, having that moment of like, boom, you know what I mean? Exactly. But it gets easier after you do your first book. It's always easier. And I'm sure any author would agree. <laughs> well, that kind of leads me to my next question where it seems like changing genres would be really difficult. Um, has that crossed your mind? Is there another genre that you think you might like to write in? And do you have any authors or books that you would look to when looking to move in a different direction? Well, um, the one book that I actually thought I would start out writing, I have still not published, which is basically about how to um, learn how to use your camera or your phone or whatever digital device you have to take photographs. And I've actually, I've written, I've written it over 12 years ago, and I was discouraged to produce it because I was told technology is going to change. It won't be by, you know, it won't make sense, you know, in a very short period of time. And what I realized is that's not true that the basic um, concepts still remain, you know, still hold true. And so that's a very different genre than my, you know, historical uh, nonfiction. Um, it is nonfiction, of course, but I, I see a lot of pretty picture books out there, but a lot of them are um, just either over the top or, um, you know, really basic. And I kind of want to create something that would be useful to a variety of of photographers and people that want to enjoy the process and not have it be too scary, too technical, or too challenging. So that is sort of on my back burner right now. And I'm it's inching its way forward. Are there any particular books or authors that make you think, you know, this is kind of the direction that inspired me to re rethink um, the, where I want to go? Well, what I see is that there are a lot of authors that are very accomplished and they have had um, frustrating experiences with big publishers and that have gone and done things on their own. I've seen people that don't know what they're doing, but they have great ideas and how they bring the things together to put them down into um, you know, a memoir or, or something that they would like to leave behind as their legacy. And so all of these different people have inspired me in, in various different ways. And I think there's there's um, inspiration from everybody that I meet that is an author and, you know, not one specific one. Um, but I think that the way people go about telling the stories is vastly different. And I find that completely fascinating. And so I realize that there's no one way to do anything and you really need to forge your own and figure out what's right for you. So I'm sorry that's not more specific, but that's, my thought process. No, it's a good answer. Um, and, and you've touched on this quite a bit, but I just wondered if you wanted to expand on how your own history and work experience has influenced what you read in addition to what you write. Hmm. Well, um, what I, that's, that's a good question. A lot of what I do for my work experience and my background has had to do with organizing uh, project managing things, whether it's a photography shoot or publishing a book and that type of thing. And so when I start reading a book and it seems like it's not, it, a lot of times books you know go back in time, there's flashbacks and this and that. And when it gets too complicated, I find that really challenging. So not that things have to be in a straightforward fashion, but if I start getting confused and have to flip back and forth in a book, I think that makes it a lot harder on the reader. And um, and so I, I would prefer to not 
create something that is so challenging that, you know, it might frustrate whoever's reading it. And I know that, you know, some books actually in the, in the front or even in the back, they have a list of characters. And so you can try to keep everybody straight. And, um, that's sort of a warning for me, <laughs> but, uh, you so know, no I game like to make things, pardon me? No Game of Thrones. Right, right. Um, I like to keep things interesting, but not work because I, I kind of feel that a book should be an escape. You know, when I come home at the end of the day, even if I'm tired, I kind of feel like I'm going to, you know, crawl under the covers and, you know, pull out one of my friends and um, spend some time, you know, reading. So, you know, that's how I look at it. And I don't want it to be too much work for anyone. I have to confess, I haven't read your Bancroft book, but I imagine that keeping that balance between the number of people that have had an impact on a hundred year old building in a way that's cohesive for a reader must be really challenging. How did you, how did you navigate that? As far as bringing, you know, getting the people involved, that type of thing? Uh, just the history of the building. I'm sure that there were a number of notable figures and events and that sort of thing that have happened throughout the building and how, how that uh, pulled together in your book. Well, interestingly, first of all, when we when I put the book together, I didn't write the history. I had, had one of the um, people that had a studio in the building write it. It was only it was not very many pages in the original book, and we actually made a mistake because we thought the building was built in uh, 1910, and it turns out it was actually built in 1908. But we didn't realize that until after the book was published. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but then later. Um, about 10 years later, I produced this book about the building. And that particular book, we worked with authors James Parr and Kevin Swope, who did proper research, you know, more research. And they have a history of R.H. Long, who built the building, and more history of the actual building itself. And so, um, you know, when you work with real authors, um, it really makes a difference. And so, you know, I learned that um, if you have a little more time, you know, than four months and you work with professionals, it makes a big difference. So I did a lot of the photography and they did the, the writing and the history and you know, research and all that. So it made a big difference. So, you know, there are times where things are, um, you know, I thought were correct and they weren't, um, but pulling on resources and people that are involved and, you know, people get excited about, um, history as well and you know kind of trying to dig things up and and pulling things together and one of the most interesting things that came out of this was um, a local person Ken Ken um, Lemoyne actually purchased a, a Bay State automobile that had been built in the building and supposedly one of two um, vehicles that still remain today and he's restoring it and so hopefully there will be an event one day down at that building, which is now an apartment complex that involves his car and some other things. And hopefully the authors will speak at that, but I digress. Anyway, um, so having the right people and really you know, taking the time to research is obviously a good thing to do. I realized I skipped a question. Um, I'd love to hear um, what's been a book that you've loved that you couldn't believe was better known? Uh, a Hidden Gym. Um, hmm, that's, that's a tough one because there, there's quite a few out there, but I think right now I'm just really hooked on the boy, the mole, the fox and the horse. And I think that everybody should read that. It is truly a hidden gem. Um, I think it was featured on Chronicle or Sunday morning one once recently, but, um, I think it's, it's really something worth um, looking at and you can read it in about 30 minutes or less. Uh, about how many books are on your teetering TBR pile now, uh, including paper, including electronic, including audio books? How many have you got balanced oh, on there? Well, there's about 20 on the night side table. And then I had to take some off and put them on a shelf somewhere because it was going to fall over. Um, and some are big and some are small. But I, I'd say, I don't know, 25. Um, I had to laugh because I'm in a book club. And one of our members who is, is a bit older than me, she quit the book club. And I said, why are you quitting the book club? You're one of our best members. She said, Lynn, I have over a hundred books on my to read list. I want to make sure I get through all of them before I die. And I don't have time to be in a book club. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is crazy. 
I saw a really funny meme on social media and it was, you are going to die with those books on red. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that is not good. It hurts. <laughs> yeah, it, it is tough. And sometimes I do leave through things because I just, you know, I don't want to wait, but yet I'm, I want to finish another one before I get to it. So I kind of look around a little bit and skim through the book, but in some books I've read more than once, but I try to pass them on and, and not dwell because there are so many I want to read. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've got our last question. We would love to hear from you what you've currently got, what we can look forward to you. I know you said you've got the back burner photography book. What is it that we can look forward to you and then take a few questions from our audience as well. From me, you mean from me or from, from you? Yes. What have you got in the works that we can look forward to? Well, um, something about photography, perhaps another historical book about Saxonville. I'll have to keep the rest under my hat for now, but those are things I'm thinking about. All right, well, we do have a few questions in our Q&A, so I'd love to encourage anyone in the audience to ask any additional questions at that right now, and um, we'll, we'll have the questions we have. Um, we have someone wondering, have you thought about teaching a class at Keith Tech on the process of writing your first book? I have, and I have proposed that to Keith Tech. And um, so far that hasn't been picked up, but I will continue to suggest that. Um, and this next person, Pat, I'm glad they asked because I would love to know this too. I'm only about a year and a half, two years into the community, so I'm still learning things. And they would love to know what and where is the Bancroft building? Can you share a little bit about it? Yes. So first I do want to say something which is about um, publishing your first book. From time to time, I do get together with um, designer and editor, and we do do a program called Booksmart, where we offer a one hour complimentary um, workshop on, you know, what goes into putting a book together and how to do it. And so if people um, wanted to contact me and let me know that they were interested, you know, we could put something together, whether it's uh, Zoom or in person. And we try to do that quarterly. So we would be doing something in the fall anyway. So that's one thing. Um, as far as the Bancroft building, it is at 59 Fountain Street in Framingham. So it's kind of around the corner from uh, the Loring Ice Skating Rink. And it's uh, basically adjacent to Farm Pond. And it is right now turned into apartments that are quite lovely. A second building was built there and there's a swimming pool, et cetera. Um, and um, but did that answer the question? Yeah. Can, you, can you give us a little snapshot into the history of the building? Oh, sure. So the history of the building, um, there's a gentleman named R.H. Long who built the building and it was built to originally make a variety of different things. Like first shoes, cars, made a bunch of different things for the military, hats for the military eventually. Um, but R.H. Long is the gentleman who started the Long car dealerships many of which are still around today. And um, a lot of people have history, you know, in working in the mills, the, the building is about five stories high. It's over 500 feet long in each direction. And there used to be railroad tracks on either side of it where they would you know, load and unload different things. Um, but it was a huge uh, manufacturing facility for many, many years. And um, there are still some artifacts that are left, some things that were made there, which are now housed at the Framingham History Center. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And that is actually about our time. Um, Lynn, would you be willing to share in the chat an email address or some form of contact if you have some of those inspire um, authors who want to potentially connect with you on that? Sure. I will put it in the chat and also um, on my virtual background, if you have a phone, you can do this QR code and it will give you my contact information. But I will put in my chat my... Um, information and that would be great. Fabulous, thank you so much. I um, type any, my name. <laughs> any other questions that we would like to ask Lynn? I wish I could see everybody, but um, I can see your names and thank you for joining us. I know, yes, thank you so much for being here tonight. Yeah, I'm afraid I wasn't able to change the format to a, a meeting instead of a webinar, but um, okay, great, thank you so much. Um, Thanks for coming everyone. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you everyone tonight um, for being here, for sharing your questions. Thank you so much to Lynn for sharing your thoughts, your favorite books, um, what's on your TBR. I'm sure we've got 
more to add to our own piles now. Uh, for those of you who joined us just a little bit late, um, we will be sending out in hopefully a day or so, but soon, uh, a list of all of the recommendations that Lynn had for us. And this pro uh, program was recorded tonight, as I'm sure the lovely Zoom lady told you when you joined us. And um, so it will be posted on the Ashen Public Library YouTube page as well. So if you know somebody who wasn't able to be here tonight, send them that way and they'll be able to scan their QR code as well or um, send them an email and um, check out some of the books she recommends. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Okay, good night. Have a good night.